What's up guys? Hello and welcome to this week's video which is all about these things. Bolt action rifles, or as they're more commonly referred to on the airsoft field, sniper rifles. Now if you've made it this far into the video, you've made it past my god awful impression of Norwich and I truly do apologise for that, but I couldn't think of anything better for my cold open. Also, if you're still here, consider dropping a like and a comment down below or even subscribing to the channel if you enjoy this video as everything you do there really helps the channel grow. Right, now that I've got the whole self-promoting crap out of the way, let's talk about this video, which I'm hoping will be the first in a series of videos looking to answer the question, can you build a sniper rifle for less than the cost of a Novrich SSG? Now before you jump in the comments and start a debate with someone about whether or not I've been paid to do this, no I haven't, this is purely a self-funded academic exercise looking at seeing whether or not you can actually build a sniper rifle for less than the cost of a Novrich SSG. So I should probably define some goals for this project, of which I see there being two, a primary and an extended. The primary being answering the question we've already posed, can you build your own sniper rifle that matches the performance and the look of a Novrich rifle for less than the cost of the Novrich rifle. Now if we meet that goal, we can then go look at an extended goal, which is if we spend the difference between the cost of our rifle and the Novrich rifle, what performance can we actually get out of our custom rifle? Now obviously at this point in time, I don't know if we're gonna be able to do the extended goal. It may in fact turn out that no, you can't build a similar performance rifle for the same cost as the Novrich rifle. And if that's the case, our extended goal then becomes well, how much do we need to spend to match an average goal? So, why am I doing this project? Well, unless you've been living under a rock, you may have noticed that Novrich has released a new sniper rifle recently, the SSG-96. This is the SSG-96. Now, the SSG-96 is a replica of the L96, which was the first modern British sniper rifle introduced way back in the 80s. For that, they were using the Enfield with scopes on. Now, if you haven't noticed by the uh, wall behind me, uh, I'm quite a fan of British service rifles, so I thought it was about time I got a British sniper rifle. Also, I have previously put it out there into the web that you could probably build the same type of rifle for cheaper than Novridge. So, seeing as he's doing the British service rifle, I thought I'd put my money where my mouth is and actually give it a go. Now, this could all blow up in my face and it turned out that Novridge is actually working miracles. And if that's the case, I will tell you that because this isn't about looking me looking good and I'm not going to look good. I've never teched my bolt action rifle before. I'm a complete and utter novice at it. Um, this is more about science and answering the question so others can be more informed i.e. you guys. Right, that's enough big picture stuff, so let's dive on into what we're actually gonna talk about today, which is this. The rifle we've bought and how it performs out of the box. Now this is the Sima CM706 in all of drab. It also comes in black and tan if you so choose. I picked this one up from Taiwan Gun on their Black Friday sales for about 104 pounds. Now uh, regularly it goes to 115 on their website, uh, although, I don't know if you're going to be able to get that price anymore, especially if you're based in the UK. Uh, if you're watching this at a future date, we're about to go through some, hmm, how do I put it, unstable economic times. Uh, so the price of these may vary. So to be fair, I'm going to take the price I've seen these at UK retailers and use that as my reference cost to compare against the Novrich price. So we can pick these up in the UK for about 140 pounds. One of the big things you'll notice that's different about this and the Novrich rifle is that this has a folding stock. Now there are clones out there that don't have folding stocks. I don't believe Simon does one, but will definitely do one, the MBO-1, uh, which I believe normally retails around 90 pounds. Uh, however, I went for this for two reasons. First of all, there aren't that many reviews on the uh, the Sima system, and I've been pretty impressed with other Sima products in the past, so I thought I'd pick it up and give it a go and uh, help spread some information about it. Um, and the second reason is, as I said previously, I'm a fan of British rifles, and the current British service rifle, and the current British long range rifle is a uh, descendant of the L96, the L115A3, and that has, you guessed it, a folding stock. So my plan is to get this up and running and 
turn it into as accurate a representation of an L115 as possible. But that's kind of outside the remit of this project. However, for all intents and purposes, this is a very similar rifle to a Novrich SSG 96. Right, let's have a look at what came in the box and uh, through some very clever editing, we're gonna go back in time, but you're not gonna know that because my continuity control is on point. So this box is actually pretty big, so I don't know if this is gonna fit on the tabletop can. It is a cardboard top wrapped around a foam polystyrene bottom. What information do we get? Well, we've got the olive drab version, radio tan version, black version. It's an airsoft gun. Good, we're onto a, onto a start there. Do not shoot at any human or animal. Well, I'm certainly not going to do one of those things. The real shock version. Don't think this has got any kind of shock or recoil, but hey ho. Pro sniper version, there we go. This is good stuff. Anyway, that's enough of the box. Let's uh, crack it open, see what we get with it. So it's all put into a polystyrene uh, enclosure and uh, then is sealed in some see-through plastic. So let's uh, cut through that. Right, uh, what do we get in the box? Well, silica gel keeps it dry. We get one magazine. Very nice. Oh, very nice. This, I didn't realize, we get a, a speed loader. Uh, we shall see how long this one lasts. We get a bag of BBs, and we know what we do with a bag of BBs. In the bin! And an Allen key, which I assume is for adjusting our hop up. Excellent. Also in the box we get one cleaning and unjamming rod. Now that we've seen what comes in the box, let's go over the externals of the rifle. So we'll start from the back and work our way around it. So at the back we have a nice rubber butt pad with several spaces and these can be adjusted by taking out the two Allen keys. Uh, note also the A1 branding on it. This is a play on AI branding, which is on the real ones, which stands for Accuracy International, the manufacturers of the L96 and the L115. Moving forwards, we find a pair of sling loops mirrored on either side of the rifle. And then moving forwards on the left side, we now find our spring catch for holding our stock closed. And we will find further forwards a pin on which it latches to. These are very solid. Uh, I haven't had any troubles with it. Again, moving further forwards, we now find the empty mag indicator, which is a nice little white nub. I personally think this is a better design than the Novrich version. As far as I'm aware, Novrich has a black nub against a black rifle which can be hard to see, whereas this white knob stands out once uh, an empty mag is, uh, is inserted or you run out of rounds in your magazine. Moving to the front of the stock, we find another pair of sling loops, uh, again mirrored on the left and the right hand side. And beneath that and in front of that, we find a pair of bipod mounting methods, both the Parker Hale style pin, which is a removable pin, and the Harris style, which is a loop and pin through the loop. On this rifle, we have straight fluting as opposed to Novrich's twist fluting. Uh, this is more akin to an actual L115. Uh, for some reason, Britain uses straight flutes. Pretty much everyone else doesn't bother with fluting. At the end of the barrel, we find a flat muzzle end. I wouldn't call it a break, uh, but it is threaded in, so you can remove it and put in adapters to add on suppressors or other muzzle brakes if you can find them. Now, as we come back down the rifle, again, we see the mirrored sling loops. And then on the underside at the front of the receiver, we find the magazine well. The magazine is held in place with a paddle style of release at the front. And when you push that, the magazine under spring tension pushes out quite nicely. Just in front of that magazine catch is a grub screw, which uh, allows the hop to be adjusted. For those of you wondering, you need a size 2.5 Allen key for adjusting that, uh, which is supplied in the box. Now coming back on the top of the rifle, we can see a nice long bit of Picatinny rail for attaching scopes as I've done here. And below that, we can see the mock ejection port. Coming back, we see a nice rounded bolt handle. And just behind that, we have a safety. Note that the safety only stops the trigger from being pulled. It does not stop the cocking of the rifle. Uh, note that this rifle as stock comes with an outer battery safety, which means the trigger can't be pulled if the bolt handle is not in the locked position. Although I have already removed that feature to make it more akin to the Novrich rifle. Looking at the trigger, we can see it's got a Glock style of safety on it as well. Uh, so you can't pull the trigger unless you're pulling the uh, secondary trigger inside of it. Just in front of the trigger, we have a quick release latch for changing out the uh, bolt of the rifle. 
So you just push it down and then you can pull the bolt out provided you either take the cheek rest off or on this model you can just fold the stock to the side and slide it straight out. Now speaking of the folding stock, here we can see the button that releases it. Just push it and the stock will fold open. And just in front of that we have a sling loop but only on the right hand side of the rifle. Moving into the back half of the stock we can see two big nerve bolts. These uh, release the cheek rest which can be adjusted up and down to adjust your eye line onto the sight. Then at the very bottom of the stock we have a monopod which has both a quick spring adjustable position uh, and a fine adjust twist. It's nice that they've included the uh, monopod on the rifle because it is a feature found on the L115 but it serves no real useful purpose in the, uh, the airsoft world. Note there is one feature that is not present on this rifle that Novriches does have uh, and that is the cocked indicator. Personally I'm not too fussed about not having that feature. It's a nice to have but it's not a deal breaker for me. It's all well and good looking at the features of the rifle but we can't really get a feel for it until we see how it performs stock. So to do this I went to a recent game at Gunman Tuddenham. Here we see me trying to stop an enemy advance on our dug-in position in the trench network. Unfortunately, pretty much every shot I make either flies up left or right and misses the target. Watch out, guys got a bead on me. So let's watch the shots again, but slow down, and I'll highlight where the BBs go. So as we can see, the consistency of these shots is uh, is not quite there yet, and there's definitely something that needs to be improved upon. However, I can note that as the day went on, the uh, groupings got slightly better, which was probably the hop-up rubber bedding in a bit. And by the end of the morning gameplay, uh, I managed to get at least two confirmed kills with the rifle, and this one, being the most impressive, threw a hole in a wall. Oh, oh I got a sniper kill! Yes! One aim of the day done! So after the game day, I came home and put the rifle through the chrono using the same hop-up setting and the same BBs that I used to play with. Uh, for note, these are Jeff Super Precision 0.4 gram BBs. I use these ones as these were the heaviest BBs that I could reliably hop with the rifle. And after putting 10 rounds through the chrono, I found that the average FPS on 0.4s worked out to be 310 FPS, uh, but with a 14.5 FPS variance across the 10 shots, which works out about a 4.7% variance, which is quite a lot. Converting that through into joules, it works out at about 1.8 joules, uh, with a 10% power variance which is a lot, and then going through to 0.2 grams, that works out at about 440 FPS. Now, I haven't tested it on lighter weight BBs, and I probably should to see if there's any kind of negative dual creep or positive dual creep on the rifle, but at the moment, if I want to get up to the power limits, I'm going to need to change up the spring. Also, that FPS variance is slightly worrying, and it's something that will need to be addressed to get this rifle more reliable. Bringing in that variance in FPS will help bring in the grouping of the rifle. So now that we've seen how the rifle shoots, let's have a look at the inside of it to see what internals there are that are giving us this performance. Tearing it down couldn't be more easy. It requires a long Phillips screwdriver, a short thin Phillips screwdriver, a set of Allen keys, and some needle nose pliers. So first things first, let's take the uh, bolt out of the rifle. To do this, pull down on the quick release tap. I find it easier to open the stock than take the cheek rest off and then simply slide the bolt out of the rifle. And there's the bolt and cylinder assembly. Now we can flip the rifle over 
and take out the three screws located at the back of the trigger guard, just behind the magwell and just in front of the magwell. For this we're going to use the long screwdriver to do the rear two and the short screwdriver to do the front one. Once they're undone and they are self-retained, we can simply lift the stock off the rest of the receiver. At this point, the cylinder latch will simply come out of the trigger box and a quick check shows that it is cast and not steel. Now we can take the trigger box off the receiver. This can be done by simply removing the two screws at the front and the back and then lifting the whole trigger box off of the receiver. The trigger box itself is made of cast metal with the load bearing components looking to be made of steel. We'll check that in a minute. Note the hole in the top of the trigger box where I've removed the outer battery safety. Now we can loosen the grub screw to allow us to take the barrel off of the receiver. Once that's loosened, simply unscrew the barrel and the receiver and the barrel should come apart. The receiver itself seems to be nicely cast with the Picatinny rail screwed on top. Uh, it is not steel, but could be aluminium. Now to get the hop up out of the outer barrel, we need to remove the magazine catch which is held in place by one screw. With the screw loosened off you simply pull the magazine catch off and now we're ready to move the hop chamber. Using the screwdriver push down through the mag window to push the hop chamber out and it should slide out of our outer barrel. This is the gun mostly disassembled as we can see here. Now let's dive on into the cylinder. For this we're going to use our needle nose pliers to unscrew the cylinder head. Once it's loosened, we can just unscrew it by hand. Looking at the cylinder head, it seems to be a one-piece design made out of brass. Note that it has an o-ring on it and also has threading in the nozzle, which I believe is for restrictors to be fitted to lower the FPS without changing the spring. Right, let's grab the calipers and measure some parts. The spring has a 10mm outer diameter and the piston appears to be a 22mm diameter. The piston seems to be made from the famous Simon polymer with a single o-ring and a few glide rings along its length. Looking along the latching shelf of the piston we can, can't see any form of wear from the uh, couple of hundred shots I've put through the rifle so far. The spring guide is also made from the same polymer. Looking at the cylinder construction, it's made from aluminium tube crimped onto the bolt handle assembly. There doesn't appear to be any wobble in this part at the moment, however this could wear down over time and break. I can't see any problems with the inside surface of the cylinder. The spring itself is a non-linear type. Now moving on to the hop chamber, we can see it is made up of primarily two cast parts. To disassemble it, first we need to loosen off the adjustment grub screw and then we can undo the brass clamp that clamps the barrel into the hop unit. With that undone we can slide the barrel assembly out of the hop chamber. Then we can slide off the collar that is used to adjust the hop. Opening the hop arm we can see that mine has been shipped without a spring installed which I believe is a factory issue. Also we can see that this hop arm has a one piece nub cast into it. Here we can see the barrel assembly. Looking at the hop rubber, it is a standard Type 96 design rubber with a standard nub. It feels pretty nice and I'm sure it's going to give adequate results. In front of the bucking we find a small plastic piece which is used to centre the barrel in the hop chamber. Here we can see the grooves that it aligns into. Then in front of that is a small C-clip with which the barrel locking nut pushes against to hold the barrel firmly in place. Now let's dive on into the trigger box. First we remove the uh, safety catch, making sure to carefully remove the spring detent from the trigger box. Then remove the five screws to take apart the trigger box. I tend to use a screwdriver to pry a pry it apart. Here we can see the trigger box in its modified configuration. Here's the trigger, trigger spring, trigger bar, trigger bar spring and sear. Note that the sear is magnetic, as well as the trigger bar. And here we see the stock configuration of the trigger box with the outer battery safety installed. Notice the flat surface on the cocking handle, which interacts with the outer battery safety. 
So to bring this video to a close, let's answer the question, is this rifle scammishable out of the box? Realistically, no. There's a big FPS variance between shots and the grouping is not that tight. It is definitely not going to be a long range rifle at the moment. It might be alright out to, you know, 30, 40, maybe 50 metres, but beyond that it's really potluck as to whether the BB goes where you want it to. So can you play with it? Yes. Is it really a sniper rifle? Mm, not really. So what's the next steps in this project? Well, we need to start working on the rifle and improving its performance. I think we should start by trying to do the, uh, the cheapest thing first, and that will be stabilising the inner barrel in the outer barrel, because at the moment it's free to wobble about in there, and that's probably one of the biggest causes in our inconsistency in the rifle. So I can see there being three methods to doing this. One is buying barrel spaces, two is 3D printing barrel spaces, and three is uh, probably the jankiest of the lot, and that's using electrical tape <laughs> to wrap the barrel and stuff it in the outer barrel. So if you wanna see that, make sure you're subscribed, and I'll be posting that video hopefully soon, although I'm in a tier four area at the moment, so I don't know when I'll be able to get out to test my ideas. So until that video drops, stay safe and happy new year. Bye-bye.